close your eyes. Come on, close your eyes. Imagine you're going to your first hackathon. You walk into a room full of developers that are coding like crazy. Can you feel the energy in the room? Okay, so now what do you see? What's the first picture that comes into your mind? I'll tell you what I see. I see a room full of men, some are wearing bright printed t-shirts, some have caps on their heads, they have their laptops where they're working on. I can even smell the coffee they're drinking. Now how many of you in this room have a similar image? Who sees the same thing? No one? <laughs> Who sees a room full of women? No one. No one sees a room full of women. Okay, so we don't even know each other, but we have a pretty similar vision. And that's because we are all victims of stereotype. We all have biased views. Okay. <laughs> Can you imagine that women shouldn't be able to code? Okay. I tried to step out of these gender stereotypes. The first of them says that a woman who shows her emotions in the workplace is too fragile or too unstable to lead. I decided to listen to my emotions, to work with them and to act with them. Another stereotype says that a woman, oh, <laughs> another stereotype says that a woman who wants to succeed in her career should not have children, otherwise make, have children as late as possible. Well, I didn't want to choose between having a career or having a baby. In fact, I had four babies, or I have four children, I have a digital agency, and I have founded an international nonprofit organization. But how can we go and fight gender stereotype? So I'm gonna tell you a bit more about myself, a little bit of my story, and how I was first face, how I first experienced gender injustice. So I was born in Brazil. My mom, she's half Brazilian, half English, and I have a Japanese father. That's why I'm like this. <laughs> and I studied, and at a very early age, at about 12, I went to South Africa um, to carry on studying. So I had very um, biased education. It was during the apartheid years. It was in the early 90s. And I went to a white school. Um, and there we had a class called Home Economics, where the girls, we learn how to clean, how to sew, and how to cook, while boys, they learn how to do metalwork and how to do woodwork. The same gender gap was also present in sport. I remember going to watch a friend's brother go rowing in a river, very, very beautiful river, close to Johannesburg. And I was so excited when I saw this, you know, because in Brazil we have soccer, we have volleyball, but I had never seen regattas um, and rowing before. So I said to my friends, come on, let's go row. And they said, we can't. And I said, how come? She says, because we are girls. So I said, so what? Girls are not allowed to row. It's not a girl's sport. Rowing is a boy's sport. So for months and months, we kept on asking our headmaster, Come on, this makes no sense. How come girls cannot row? So after months of asking him um, if we could make a girls rowing team, he said, okay. We were so motivated, really so motivated, to show that girls could do just as good as boys, and there was no reason why we couldn't do the same sport. So we trained very hard. We'd wake up like at five in the morning, go training, go to school, after school. In the weekends, we'd go do the regattas. We had blisters all over our hands. It wasn't very pretty, but anyway. Um, and I'm very proud to say that at the end of that same year, that same season, we won Junior South African Championships. We were running championships. Yeah. <laughs> and this gave me, taught me such a big lesson in life. It was my real first experience. I was only 15 years old. And it showed me the power of being a motor. You have to be a motor in life. Um, the power of teamwork, of hard work, and most of all, the power of taking action. When there is an injustice, when there's something not, you don't agree with, you have to take action. You cannot be a victim of life. I don't know how many of you did the 10-year challenge that you see on social media. Did you do, some of you? Well, I tried doing it. And 10 years ago, I was the director of this big group 
of hotels and casinos in France, because I lived in France later on, considering my whole life. And um, I had a very good job. I had a good career, a beautiful house, a very good salary. But everything was perfect, but it was only on the paper. In fact, I wasn't happy. I wasn't living the life that I wanted to. So I decided to change everything, my career and my husband. <laughs> so I said, OK, what do I really want in life? And my dream was to have more time to spend with my children. I wanted to be independent. I wanted to travel. I wanted to be able to arrange my time as I wanted. and wanted to do something creative. So how did I go from having this dream, living it, and making it happen? I learned how to code. I said, OK, let's learn how to code. And with this digital skill, but learning how to code, I started making small websites. From these small websites, I started doing some social media campaigns. And then after that, um, some small applications, some small apps. And the digital skills gave me really the independence and the financial independence that I was looking for. It gave me the life that I was dreaming. So 10 years later, I have a digital agency that's called Social Brain. We have done hundreds and hundreds of websites. We have clients all over the world. And we manage a group of social media followers for clients of over 1 million followers for our clients. So um, we've gone a long way. And that's all thanks, thanks to tech. It really gave me the dream I was, I was hoping for. But it wasn't easy. Really, really, I must say um, that I had so many failures on the way that, wow, I don't know if I had done that for, if I hadn't if I had known how difficult it would be. Um, I had so many failures that I think I became an expert in it. You know, I'm an expert in failing forward. But at least, you know, you learn, you, you fail, you try something, it doesn't work, you try again until it works, and you carry on and carry on, and that's how you learn. And I completely agree with Ginny Ramati. I don't know if you know what she said. She's the CEO of IBM. And she says that comfort and growth never come together. And this is so true. I think it's the... the when you have challenges and you face challenges in your life, these are the moments where you can grow the most. I remember, <clears throat> um, it was just a couple of years back, it was maybe one, one and a half years back, I had just had my fourth child, because I have four children, I'm a bit unconscious, um, and I, was, I had a very difficult pregnancy. I had to stay laid down for the last four or five months of pregnancy, otherwise I would lose the baby. Um, so the first time I came to, to Portugal was just after I had the baby. I was still breastfeeding. And I, because I couldn't really move for the last few months, I was so full of energy, in fact. I really wanted to, to eat life, you know? So I came to Web Summit because I wanted to feel inspired. I wanted to come and meet people, see what was going on, and really get inspired by the other people that were living the same things and that were working in the same business as I were. But what I discovered was that, in fact, women were very, very little represented in the tech industry. In fact, the numbers, they speak for themselves. Only 17% of the workforce in the tech industry are women. 17%. 5% in leadership positions. That means 95% of leadership positions in the tech industry today are by men. So I said, wow. You know, it threw me back a few years back, you know, in the row, and said, how can this be? But that's not the worst. The worst is that every year, this gender gap was getting larger and larger. So in 2010, the numbers were better than in 2015. I said, come on, we cannot go back in history. So from that day on, I decided, okay, I'm going to commit myself. I'm going to fight to find equality in the tech industry, because it's really, really important. It's a matter of democracy, in fact. If we think about how technology influences our living, everything we, we look around, this is technology. It not only drives our economy, but it's going to invent our future. So we cannot have products that are being built by men to represent, to represent women. And if you don't act today, 
Every year, we're going to have less, be less and less represented. Women will have no voice on what the future will be, on what the society will be, on what our, where our children are going to be learning. So that's why I decided to find, to create Women in Tech. And I'm very proud to say that yesterday, Women's Day, so one year later, we, we were launching our Portuguese Women in Tech chapter here in Portugal, in Lisbon, where it all was born, where everything was born. And today, Women in Tech, we have members all over the world, thousands of members all over the world. We are represented in over 60 countries, and we're opening chapters all over Europe, and in Brazil very soon, and in Mexico as well, and all of this in one year. Why? Because we feel that this feeling of injustice, of equality, of having a big vision, is not something that I would, was my own, but was something that was really shared with everyone around. So, let's do the 10-year challenge again. I'm going to all ask you to close your eyes. We are in 2029. You walk into a room full of developers. And what do you see? I hope you see the same thing. Thank you very much.